The other thing that has been characterized is there is a regulatory entity within our cells that's called the NLRP3 inflammasome. And this is a basically like a master sergeant who oversees a platoon of inflammatory soldiers. And this regulates multiple downstream inflammatory pathways. And this, this, when this inflammasome comes together, it works. If it doesn't come together, it doesn't work. And beta-hydroxybutyrate blocks the assembly of the NLRP3 inflammasome. Uh, a study that was uh, published by Jeff Volick's graduate student, Cassandra Forsyth, uh, uh, she got three or four papers out of this and, and got her PhD. This paper is highly cited. I think it's been cited over 200 times since 2007. Um, and basically what Cassandra and Jeff did was they recruited 40 people with metabolic syndrome, and half of them they gave a low-fat diet, restricted in calories to 1,500 calories per day. So metabolic syndrome includes obesity. These are people who would like to lose weight. So they recruited them and said, we're going to give you a really nice flavored, good, real food diet. And Dr. Zinn would be very happy with, with the fact that this is um, all real foods. We didn't use any highly processed foods. We are almost none in, in putting it together. And um, they, they, ate this, they were given this diet for, for three months. The other group uh, were randomized to the ketogenic diet. Um, but they gave them the, the freedom to eat as much as they want. And the reason why we did that is we know that when you take people like this and give them a, a well-formulated ketogenic diet, they under-eat calories by about 1,000 calories per day. So these two groups were actually matched in caloric intake. One group was calorie restricted, and one group was eating to satiety. Ate about the same number of calories. And you'll notice in red at the bottom that the ones on the low-fat diet got 12 grams of saturated fat per day. And the ones on the high-fat diet got three times as much, 36 grams of saturated fat per day. What, what do you think is going to happen to their blood saturated fat levels? You know, you are what you eat. They're eating three times as much saturated fat. We'll come back to that. Two more slides. Uh, weight loss. Um, the group that got the ketogenic diet lost twice as much weight as the group that followed the, the control diet. Ostensibly, they were eating the same number of calories, but these were outpatients, and they had the opportunity to eat other stuff. Um, so we don't know. You know, we did not have 24-7 cameras mounted on, on these people. Then the question is, how much of that is water? You know, when you go on a ketogenic diet, you lose quite a bit of body water. Well, you lose water associated with glycogen in muscles. But if you don't have edema, you're not going to lose that much more water. Or if you do, you're going to reduce your circulating volume and your cortisol level is going to go up. But the result was that when we did body composition with DEXA, dual x-ray absorptiometry, the group on the ketogenic diet, one kilogram of their 10 kilograms of weight loss was due to, to extra, extra body water loss. And the other nine kilograms was what they wanted to lose. And you notice that the range, the median weight loss in the ketogenic diet group, the, the, the um, bars coming down on the, on the right-hand side there, the, the red bar there for the, or line for the, the people on the ketogenic diet, uh, the average value of weight loss was greater than the greatest weight loss in the other, other group. But the most important thing is these people were people with metabolic syndrome, and the metabol components of metabolic syndrome um, uh, are outlined in green there. And you can see that the red bars um, were uh, dramatically better than the blue bars. The blue bars are being the low-fat diet, and the red bars are the ketogenic diet. Um, and then the other really interesting thing on the far right-hand side so outlined in orange is the blood triglyceride levels of saturated fat. So this is the fuel triglyceride circulating through your blood. And the ones who got the, got the ketogenic diet with 36 grams of saturated fat had more than double the reduction in blood saturated fat. So if you have a little card that you carry with you say, you are what you eat, Tear it up. <laughs> you are what you say from what you eat. And one of the, the resilient and robust metabolic characteristics of, of nutritional ketosis is you give the body the permission to burn at least twice as much fat as when they're not on a ketogenic diet. And that's whether they're at rest or exercise. And it's clearly one of the, the, fat, the, sat, the fats that the body prefers to burn when you give it permission to burn twice as much fat is saturated fat. It only hurts you if it builds up in your blood. If you're keto adapted, you can eat saturated fat. I won't say to abandon, but as a significant proportion of your fat coming from um, uh, uh, coconut oil, from animal fats, wherever, uh, and you will burn it for fuel, turn it into CO2 and water, and contribute to global warming.
But speaking about warming and inflammation, we measured 14 biomarkers, bioactive compounds, associated with inflammation in these patients. It was a three-month-long study. And <clears throat> of, the, of the 14, seven of them came down significantly in the group, great to a greater degree in the group on the ketogenic diet compared to the control diet. And those are a little alphabet salad here. But what I want to point out is, interestingly, over on the right-hand side, those are the column, that, that, in that column was the things that didn't come down. And one was white blood cell count, and one was CRP. And it turns out that all things, all these different keys on the keyboard don't respond in lockstep in the early phases of keto adaptation. And C-reactive protein in particular is one of the slow responders. So I've seen multiple papers of people doing well done ketogenic diet studies, and they measure C-reactive protein and say, see, inflammation doesn't come down. You know? It's like you know, running a really, really fast quarter mile, but you never, you never get the gold cup at the, at the one mile mark in a one mile race. You gotta run the whole race. It, it takes longer than, than three months for CRP to respond to <clears throat> this, this type of intervention. So cutting to the chase, most, more recently, the study we, we did with Dr. Sarah Hallberg in Indiana, where now we've completed five years, by the way, and she survived through the, the final rec uh, uh, patient visits at the five-year time point, um, and that was part of her commitment to, to this process. So we recruited 262 people. Actually, we recruited close to 500. There was a, a, about 100 people in a a, a non-randomized parallel usual care group, and then of almost 400 people total, 262 had diabetes, and the remainder of them had prediabetes. So focusing on the people with diabetes, um, they were about two-thirds female, average age 54, um, very overweight, average BMI was 41, had lots of weight to lose. Um, and importantly, the average duration of time since diagnosis was over eight years. These are not, not new onset, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, early stage people with diabetes. Some of these people had diabetes for 20 years. The majority of them were on two or more drugs, um, metformin plus something else, and some of them were on multiple drugs. Um, and they were managed through a, um, a basically a remote continuous care app uh, across the full two years of the study, uh, and the patients um, had access to a coach and to a physician, in the case of the study, to Dr. Hallberg, on a continuous basis, seven days a week. They could, they could reach out through the app and get in contact with someone. Um, they got um, most of their education through video and, and, and printed materials. Um, they monitored their blood glucose and their blood ketones. They stood on the scale every day. Um, they couldn't uh, uh, misreport their weight because it was a cell phone connected scale. The only way you could mess it best with it is hold on to a bunch of helium balloons while standing on the scale. Um, and, and, the, and these were a very committed group of people because all of them had met and interacted with Dr. Hallberg and her ability to connect with people and convey the sense of benefit to them and the, the sense of the mission was just absolutely incredible for this study. Um, this is an older slide. We've, we've published at this point, 11 papers from, from this one study. Um, but these are the papers that demonstrated one year and two year data in, uh, on diabetes and also cardiovascular risk. I'll focus just on the two year data. So this is a paper published uh, uh, in Frontiers of Endocrinology and we presented it at Obesity Week in 2018. So it's not brand new. The blue line across the top shows retention in the study. And um, you can see at one year we had 83% retention uh, in the people with type 2 diabetes, and two years, 74% retention. Uh, and I'm not bragging, you can go look. Um, in lifestyle studies, maintaining half the people in a study at one year is considered good. And having this, this level of retention at two years is remarkable. And then the embedded graph there on the lower left-hand side shows the daily blood ketones in patients uh, over a one-year period of time, and you can see that uh, out to eight months on the, of that one-year time frame, the group mean value for beta hydroxybutyrate was 0.5 millimolar. So people who tell you that patients can't maintain this, wrong. People can maintain it. You just have to give them permission to do it and proper information in terms of how to do it, and it can be done. 
Uh, at at uh, two years, our, our mean value was down to about 0.3, but it was still statistically significantly above their baseline value. So the ketogenic diets can be maintained. They're really hard to do, and it takes a really robust support system to allow the majority of people to do this. When they did that, the, the blue line here shows the weight loss at, at um, uh, one year was about uh, 35 pounds of weight loss, and that's with the 80 plus percent retention. And at two years, the, there was a five pound weight regain, but they still maintained a 30 pound weight loss, which is truly remarkable among non-drug assisted or surgery assisted uh, lifestyle interventions. And then the, <clears throat> the usual care group, you can see that, that uh, their weight went up over the two-year period of time. Um, and on the right-hand side, you can see that hemoglobin A1C dropped about 1.2 units at one year, and we maintained a 0.9 unit reduction. And 0.9 unit reduction is, more th is the same or more than you would expect from one full, you know, powerful type 2 diabetes um, intervention drug. The other thing that occurred in the first um, uh, over this time period is we reduced and maintained the patients off more than half of their diabetes medications. And uh, for the people who started on, on, on um, insulin, half of them stopped their insulin in the first month. And you heard, heard Dr. Penny uh, Figtree mention that, and she also, uh, and I was delighted to hear her say, that this is not an easy thing to do in the monitor. And the way that we can do this safely in a very large number of people, and we now have tens of thousands of people in whom we're doing this, is because we have the app, and they have continuous access to a trained physician uh, and working with a, a, a trained coach. This is now um, a graph of the uh, uh, 12 different biomarkers that are associated with coronary disease risk that has been formally um, uh, um, uh, proposed as a way of measuring uh, long-term uh, disease risk, 10-year disease risk. Uh, and um, the, this, the overall disease score is reduced by 12%. The only fly in the ointment is there in the middle that downward pointing arrow with a red core is LDL cholesterol. And if blue goes up, it's because the ketogenic diet improved it. If blue goes down, the ketogenic diet made it worse. On average, LDL went, went up, but the, arrow, the things pointed down there. LDL went up about 10%, 9% in, in this population. But the HDL cholesterol went up markedly. Um, so pretty much everything else improved uh, and the result is that the, this calculated disease score, where we don't look at just one key on the keyboard, but we look at the whole keyboard, is getting better. Cutting to the chase, inflammation. We measured 16 biomarkers. Um, two of them were not significant. The one on the right, where it goes up, which is uh, VCAM1, is not actually a, a risk, is not associated with diabetes risk. But, and over on the left-hand side, the, the uh, ICAM-1 was reduced at one year in blue and uh, further reduced at two years in, in red, but it wasn't statistically significant. All the other reductions were sig significant. If you look at the far left-hand side, the well-formulated ketogenic diet at one year reduced C-reactive protein uh, by um, over 30%. And it wasn't significantly reduced further, but the, at two years, we had the, uh, an even uh, greater reduction in CRP. Um, but the important thing is we changed the level of inflammatory stimulus across the whole keyboard. So there was a balanced effect of this. But realize we've evolved with this molecule since the liver was invented. This is, a, uh, this is an evolutionarily um, long-lasting thing that, that through evolution, the body has figured out, you know, how, do we, how do we play this music where we respond when necessary to challenges like inflammation or like infection and, or trauma, and then how do we shut it back down into to the normal resting range when it's not doing us harm, and, and clearly we're doing this in a balanced manner. So coming back to this picture here, um, you know, there are multiple roles for this, this molecule. As you can guess, there are people who are trying to figure out how we get this molecule into people without having to go on a ketogenic diet. And the folks at the Buck Institute are working on a 
um, one of a, a, a class of compounds, one of a class of compounds called ketoesters, where you're not eating ketone salts, but you're actually getting these in a, where you don't have to have a lot of, of uh, uh, sodium and potassium and magnesium. Those are good things to take in moderation. But if you want to get 75 or 100 grams of ketones into someone, you can't give them that much as ketone salts. So they're working on these, these things called ketone esters, uh, where exogenous ketones may be able to achieve some of these effects. And as I mentioned, when they infused beta-hydroxybutyrate into mice for one day, they got a measurable effect on, on gene expression. So don't discount exogenous ketones. But my liver probably makes 75 to 100 grams of, of ketones per day. Currently, ketones of various forms probably cost in the US about a dollar per gram. So my liver is making about 75 to 100 dollars worth of of good stuff every day, and all I have to do is eat good food. So in terms of other inflammatory diseases, this is just a, a wish list. Yeah, if you say, oh, Steve Finney says it works for multiple sclerosis and, and depression and uh, arthritis and asthma, we have lots of anecdotes of that. I could have come up with 10 or 20 cases, but until we study it in a prospective, randomized way and demonstrate that it is, is robust, that is, it last, it, it'll work for a long period of time, and that it's safe. Um, these are, these are, this is our, our wish list of what we want to do. And you know, my conclusion is there's no drug in chronic use that can deliver these potent, potent effects safely. This is a truly unique tool. And um, um, I think we came up with an interesting acronym we call it NOODLE, and that's not a carbohydrate food. It's N-E-W-L-E, it's nutrients with drug-like effects. And this is the poster child for that concept. The, the diet it, um, is, is potent and both, both broadly based. It um, requires giving people adequate support um, and, and, and informa inflammation, information, and that's not easy for people, people to do. Not everybody can do it. And there are times in people's lives when they're ready for change and times when they're not. So it's not something you tell people, you need to do this now. You say, this is available when you're ready. We're here for you. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we have lots of future targets to study. And with that, I'll brag about the fact that once upon a time, I climbed a mountain that was 14,000 feet high with no carbs. And thank you. resilient and robust metabolic characteristics of, of nutritional ketosis is you give the body the permission to burn at least twice as much fat as when they're not on a ketogenic diet. And that's whether they're at rest or exercise. And it's clearly one of the, fat, the, sat, the fats that the body prefers to burn when you give it permission to burn twice as much fat is saturated fat. It only hurts you if it builds up in your blood. If you're keto adapted, you can eat saturated fat. I won't say to abandon, but as a significant proportion of your fat coming from coconut oil, from animal fats, wherever, uh, and you will burn it for fuel, turn it into CO2 and water, and contribute to global warming. <laughs> but speaking about warming and inflammation, we measured 14 biomarkers, bioactive compounds, associated with inflammation in these patients. It was a three-month-long study. And of the, of the 14, seven of them came down significantly in the group, great to a greater degree in the group on the ketogenic diet compared to the control diet. Interestingly, over on the right-hand side, those are the column, that, that, in that column was the things that didn't come down, and one was white blood cell count, and one was CRP. And it turns out that all things, all these different keys on the keyboard don't respond in lockstep in the early phases of keto adaptation. And C-reactive protein, in particular, is one of the slow responders. So I've seen multiple papers of people doing well-done ketogenic diet studies, and they measure C-reactive protein and say, see, inflammation doesn't come down. It's like you know, running a really, really fast quarter mile, but you never, you never get the gold cup at the, at the one mile mark in a one mile race. You've got to run the whole race. It, it takes longer than, than three months for CRP to respond to <clears throat> this, this type of intervention. So cutting to the chase, most, more recently, the study we, we did with Dr. Sarah Hallberg in Indiana, where now we've completed five years, by the way, and she survived through the, the, the final um, uh, 
patient visits at the five-year time point. Um, and that was part of her commitment to, to this process. So we recruited 262 people. So focusing on the people with diabetes, um, they were about two-thirds female, average age 54, um, very overweight, average BMI was 41, had lots of weight to lose. Importantly, the average duration of time since diagnosis was over eight years. These are not, not new onset. The majority of them were on two or more drugs, um, metformin plus something else, and some of them were on multiple drugs. Had access to a coach and to a physician, in the case of study, to Dr. Hallberg. On a continuous basis, seven days a week, they could, they could reach out through the app and get in contact with someone. They monitored their blood glucose and their blood ketones. They stood on the scale every day. I focused just on the two-year data. So this was a paper published uh, uh, in Frontiers of Endocrinology, and we presented it at Obesity Week in 2018, so it's not brand new. The blue line across the top shows retention in the study, and um, you can see at one year we had 83% retention uh, in the people with type 2 diabetes, and two years, 74% retention. Uh, and I'm not bragging, you can go look. Um, in lifestyle studies, maintaining half the people in a study at one year is considered good. And having this, this level of retention at two years is remarkable. And then the embedded graph there on the lower left-hand side shows the daily blood ketones in patients uh, over a one-year period of time. And you can see that uh, out to eight months on the, of that one-year time frame, the group mean value for beta hydroxybutyrate was 0.5 millimolar. So people who tell you that patients can't maintain this, wrong. People can maintain it. You just have to give them permission to do it and proper information in terms of how to do it. When they did that, the, the blue line here shows the weight loss at, at um, uh, one year was about uh, 35 pounds of weight loss, and that's with the 80 plus percent retention. And at two years, the, there was a five pound weight regain, but they still maintained a 30 pound weight loss, which is truly remarkable among non-drug assisted or surgery-assisted uh, lifestyle interventions. And then the, <clears throat> the usual care group, you can see that, that uh, their weight went up over the two-year period of time. Um, and on the right-hand side, you can see that hemoglobin A1C dropped about 1.2 units at one year, and we maintained a 0.9 unit reduction. And 0.9 unit reduction is, more th is the same or more than you would expect from one full, you know, powerful type 2 diabetes um, intervention drug. The other thing that occurred in the first, um, uh, over this time period, is we reduced and maintained the patients off more than half of their diabetes medications. And uh, for the people who started on, on, on um, insulin, half of them stopped their insulin in the first month. And you heard, heard Dr. Penny uh, Figtree mention that, and she also, uh, and I was delighted to hear her say that this is not an easy thing to do in the monitor, and the way that we can do this safely in a very large number of people, and we now have tens of thousands of people in whom we're doing this, is because we have the app, and they have continuous access to a trained physician uh, and working with a, a, a trained coach. This is now uh, a graph of the 12 different biomarkers that are associated with coronary disease risk that has been formally proposed as a way of measuring long-term uh, disease risk, 10-year disease risk. The, this, the overall disease score is reduced by 12%. The only fly in the ointment is there in the middle, that downward pointing arrow with a red core is LDL cholesterol. And if blue goes up, it's because the ketogenic diet improved it. If blue goes down, the ketogenic diet made it worse. On average, LDL went, went up, but the, the things pointed down there. LDL went up about 10%, 9% in, in this population. But the HDL cholesterol went up markedly. So pretty much everything else improved. Uh, and the result is that the, this calculated disease score, where we don't look at just one key on the keyboard, but we look at the whole keyboard, is getting better. Cutting to the chase, inflammation. We measured 16 biomarkers. Two of them were not significant. The one on the right, where it goes up, which is the VCAM1, is not actually a, a risk, is not associated with diabetes risk. But, and over on the left-hand side, the, the um, uh, ICAM1, 
was reduced at one year in blue and uh, further reduced at two years in, in red, but it wasn't statistically significant. All the other reductions were sig significant. If you look at the far left-hand side, the well-formulated ketogenic diet at one year reduced C-reactive protein uh, by um, over 30%. And it wasn't significantly reduced further, but the uh, two years we had the, uh, an even uh, greater reduction in CRP. But the important thing is we changed the level of inflammatory stimulus across the whole keyboard. So there was a balanced effect of this, but realize we've evolved with this molecule since the liver was invented. This is, a, this is an evolutionarily um, long-lasting thing that, that through evolution the body has figured out how do we play this music where we respond when necessary to challenges like inflammation or like infection and, or trauma and then how do we shut it back down into to the normal resting range when it's not doing us harm and, and clearly we're doing this in a balanced manner. So they're working on these, these things called ketone esters uh, where exogenous ketones may be able to achieve some of these effects. And as I mentioned, when they infused beta-hydroxybutyrate into mice for one day, they got a measurable effect on, on gene expression. So don't discount exogenous ketones. But my liver probably makes 75 to 100 grams of, of ketones per day. Currently, ketones of various forms probably cost in the US about a dollar per gram. So my liver is making about 75 to 100 dollars worth of of good stuff every day, and all I have to do is eat good food. So, in terms of other inflammatory diseases, this is just a, a wish list. You know, if you say, oh, Steve Finney says it works for multiple sclerosis and, and depression and uh, arthritis and asthma, we have lots of anecdotes of that. I could have come up with 10 or 20 cases, but until we study it in a prospective, randomized way and demonstrate that it is, is robust, that is, it lasts, it, it'll work for a long period of time, and that it's safe. Um, these are, these are, this is our, our wish list of what we want to do. And you know, my conclusion is there's no drug in chronic use that can deliver these potent effects safely. The diet it, um, is potent and both, both broadly based. It requires giving people adequate support um, and information and that's not easy for people, people to do. Not everybody can do it. And there are times in people's lives when they're ready for change and times when they're not. So it's not something you tell people, you need to do this now. You say, this is available when you're ready.